Then one day, Brandy turns to her mom, which, you know, God bless her, Brandy didn't hide anything from mama. Brandy turns from the computer and says, hey, Jason says he wants to meet me at the mall. Um, he said, like, for you to just drop me off. But he told me not to tell you that he'd be there. And the mom laughs and she's like, yeah, that's never going to happen. And I'm thinking as she's telling this, oh, thank God, you finally clued into the fact that this guy's a complete and total nut job. And the mom's like, at that point, there were some red flags, but I just told myself that he was just joking. This guy just told your daughter, get your mom to drop you off at the mall, but don't mention I'm gonna be there. And the mom knows this and goes, it's kind of a red flag, but I'm sure it was a joke. The only joke here is you, lady, calling yourself this child's mother. Hey, how are you? My name is Jordan Nice. Today we're going to be talking about the second episode of Quiet on the Set, The Dark Side of Children's Television. So in this episode, we are introduced to the fact that it's not just a toxic work environment, although it definitely is that. It's not just chaotic. It's not just the double entendre that is in a lot of the episodes. But in this episode, we're introduced to the fact that there were two predators on set that were caught within a five-month span of each other, and yet the show must go on. This time, we're really going to focus a lot on what were the grown-ups around the kids doing. So last episode, we talked a lot about what was the culture for the kids on set. There was a lot of favoritism going on, a lot of trying to get Dan's attention. Um, and so in this episode, we're going to talk about sort of the demise, a little bit of a demise that Dan had, a little bit of uh, raised eyebrows. More people are starting to look at Dan as though maybe he's kind of a problem. We're going to look at the breakdown of his relationship with Amanda Bynes. But the big thing in this episode was the fact that there are predators on the set, predators that could have been caught much sooner than they were, one in particular. And it's really, really surprising to me how so many adults missed points of concern about all of this, not just about the child predators. One of them was very clunky about the way he went about it, so it's no surprise he was caught. And the other one was so smooth. It's like, all right, well, you know, these people are master manipulators, so I understand why he wasn't caught. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes down that it's just like, wh where are the grown-ups, And why is nobody saying anything? There is one mother who raised some concerns and her child was ostracized. So it makes sense, I guess, why people wouldn't say anything. But the question that lingers for me is, why is all of this worth it? Like at the end of the day, like play this out. Say like you get really rich and famous. At what cost to you? What cost to your kids? You know, also you had a little extra change in your pocket. People recognized you on the street. Is life so dear? And peace so sweet as to be bought at the price of chains and slavery? I mean, you know, that old quote. I just really wonder. It's like, is, is a little change in your pocket so dear? Is a little fame so much that you're willing to lay down every right you have? The right to common decency? The right to kindness? The right to not be molested and man manipulated? Not growing up with money is a real gift because you realize like life goes on whether you have it or not. It isn't really worth it to lay everything down just so you can, you know, take a bigger vacation next year, you know? Anyway, this episode really ramped up some of the darkness, but there's another element to this as well that we'll discuss, and that is this. There's a lot of terrible things that this documentary brings up, but they also try to equate a lot of things uh, as problematic that I think, okay, people are literally being abused. Children are literally being abused. And some of the things that some of these cast members wanted to get in their feelings about, I felt like was a little bit of an over-exaggeration, especially because there are real situations that people experienced that were life-alteringly traumatic. And then you've got somebody being like, then they made me get into a tub of worms. Can you believe it? I mean, I've been in therapy for this. And I kind of want to be like, really? Okay. All right. So, I mean, I don't want to diminish a person's experience, but I also sometimes think that 
we live in a culture where everybody has to have their tale of woe. And in a story in which people legitimately have something to say, it sort of diminished their trauma. We'll get to that. So the episode begins with this mom explaining her experience with her child at Nickelodeon. And it's very telling because she says, this mother says, when she had been a child, they lived in Hollywood. Her mom had been on the legal side um, working for a production company. And she saw a lot of things and she was unimpressed and swore that her son and her daughter were going to have nothing to do with this slimy business. And her daughter was really annoyed and upset by that because she felt like, you know, you're you're taking my dreams away from me. It's all I ever wanted. You know, why do you have to be so weird? Well, her mom said no. So when that woman grew up and had kids, her daughter was just entranced by the Disney Channel, by Nickelodeon. She loved kids television. She wanted to be in kids television. And so at 11, they auditioned and she got a part on a Nickelodeon show. And the mother that was talking says repeatedly how proud she felt that she could give her daughter what her daughter wanted. Basically, kind of like an F you to her mom, like you said I couldn't, but I'm not that kind of a mom. I'm not going to stop my child's experience. You know, I'm not going to stand in her the way of her dreams. She can do whatever she wants. I'm like, I'm, I'm the cool mom, you know. My stupid mom got in my way, but I'm not that kind of a mom. And I think that because she was out to prove something to herself about what kind of mom she was and how she was a better mom and a kinder mom and a, you know, cared about her child's dreams kind of mom, she let red flag after red flag go into this situation where I'm just like, if you had less of a bone to pick with your own mom, you might have been able to sit your ass down and have a little chat with yourself about what your daughter was going through. But instead, she just ignored, ignored, ignored until her daughter was assaulted, basically. So what happens is, On the show, there's this guy, his name is Jason Handy. He is a production assistant, okay? Let me say that to you again. A production assistant, a basic nobody, okay? His job was to babysit the kids, basically. Walk them here, walk them there, you know, herd them here. That was his job. So he's hanging out with the kids all day. Perfect job if you're a pervert. But he also, once he would like get the kids on set, he'd come out to the parents who were kind of sitting. They weren't like, I guess, allowed on the set, supposedly, Okay, that's, let that, let that question hang in the air. A lot of the parents said they were not allowed on set. They were told we, they couldn't go on set. So they sat like off set somewhere, but they weren't watching their kids. You have another dad later on, Drake Bell's dad, who says he was never off set. He made sure to stay within eyesight of his kid. And... I just think that if you wanted to be present where your child was, you just had to make it happen. Drake Bell's dad did. And all these other parents that were like, okay, okay, I, oh, oh, I'm not allowed, I'm not, oh, okay, uh, oh, I'm just going to go over there. No, don't. they're not allowed to push you out. They don't have a right to do that. That's your kid, and they're working your kid, and there's child labor laws involved and everything. You can be within eyesight. I'm not saying you have to go sit on the set, but you can sit off camera and make sure your kid's okay. All right, so a lot of parents are off set. And Jason Handy would go out, talk to the parents, you know, get to know them, you know, where are y'all from, da, 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 da. And he's making all the parents feel comfortable, exchanging email addresses and things like that. Well, one day, this little girl named Brandy, the one who we're talking about, whose mom was the cool mom and let her be on Nickelodeon, unlike her her mother who had stifled all her dreams. Brandy's mom and she are Brandy and her mom are driving home after a day on set. Brandy says, "Jason is so nice. Um, we've exchanged email addresses, and we're going to start emailing each other." Okay, at this point, I would have been like, "What are you talking about, Brandy? He asked for your email address? Are you kidding me? You're 11 years old, no." No, he shouldn't be doing that. Like, I I would have had issues. I would have been like, you're not emailing that guy. And I'm not saying that that would have lent me at that point to be like, and you're never going back to Nickelodeon. Because at this point, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I would have been like, that was weird. And it's one thing to exchange maybe email address with the parents. Although, what, what does a production assistant need with the parents' email addresses? He's a nobody. Like, anybody who's like, oh, you know, this is going to be a person that I know in the industry who's going to, like, help me climb the ladder. Not the production assistant's not. 
Jason's feeding little Brandy that line of, I can help you. Look, these are all the shows I work on. I can, I can give you a leg up in this. So they're emailing back and forth. Now, the mom is constantly giving all these caveats in the conversation, in the interview, by saying, well, we only had one computer, and it was in the dining room, and when she'd be on the computer with Jason, because eventually it escalates to them instant messaging each other, she says that she'd, like, you know, be reading over Brandy's back. It's all this, like, generalized stuff, you know, I'm working on this show, I, you know, it was fun to work with that person. It's like, the mom keeps acting like it's normal that this guy, this adult male, would even want to spend time talking to an 11 year old. Like, why would Jason want to do that? Even if he's not saying anything weird now, why didn't he friend of his own age? Who wants to talk to an 11 year old? Who wants to spend their off hours, instant messaging an 11 year old? Mind numbing at best, even if you had all the virtuous motivations. I, I don't want to take time off of, out of my day. Like when I'm done at the end of the day, I don't want to be like, let me get on instant messenger and you know message with a couple of 11 year olds. What? I mean, only a pervert would want to. So anyway, but the mom still in La La Land, because she's, she's the fun mom, is letting Brandy do this. Letting Brandy have a friend in the industry, the PA. Yeah, right. I mean, like, I, that's the thing that blows my mind. How, why was that an excuse that the mom told herself? Jason will help her. Jason won't. Jason can't even help himself. If he could, he wouldn't be a PA. Anyway, then one day, Brandy turns to her mom, which, you know, God bless her. Brandy didn't hide anything from mama. Brandy turns from the computer and says, hey, Jason says he wants to meet me at the mall. Um, he said, like, for you to just drop me off. But he told me not to tell you that he'd be there. And the mom laughs and she's like, yeah, that's never going to happen. And I'm thinking as she's telling this, oh, thank God, you finally clued into the guy, fact that this guy's a complete and total nut job. And the mom's like, at that point, there were some red flags. But I just told myself that he was just joking. This guy just told your daughter, drop, get your mom to drop you off at the mall, but don't mention I'm going to be there. And the mom knows this and goes, it's kind of a red flag, but I'm sure it was a joke. The only joke here is you, lady, calling yourself this child's mother. Who in their right mind would allow this to go down? So she just kind of sits on it and sits on it, doesn't really do anything about it. It's like, that was weird, but whatever. I, I, like, I can't get past that. I can't get past that the mom wasn't like, shut down the computer, never talk to Jason again, ever. And then like letting people know, other parents know, hey, this guy asked to spend time with Brandy alone at the mall and told her not to tell me. Watch out for Jason. Like I would have made sure that everyone in the community was aware. Not a catty way, but that's a weird thing to do and say. That's not something a normal guy would say. All right, well, mama doesn't do anything about it. And one day, Jason emails her a picture of himself. The mom is doing whatever she's doing. Brandy's at the computer, as she always is. And then suddenly she leaps up, turns the computer off, runs to room, slams the door. And her mom runs after her. Brandy, what's wrong? What's wrong? Brandy, something happened. What is it? <sighs> something happened, all right. Jason sent her a photograph of of himself doing stuff to himself and he says just want to let you know i'm thinking about you what so now this child has this image in her head that no 11 year old child should ever have in their head ever 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 and this could have all been avoided when brandy says jason wants to email and her mom goes okay sounds fun you've got a friend in the industry you know, it's like, I'm sure the mom feels really bad, but it gets so much worse because the mom's like, oh no, what am I going to do? Well, I should probably call the police, but I don't think I will because if I do, he's going to think I'm a bad parent. So I better not. I'll just make sure that Brandy never goes anywhere near that guy and we'll just leave the industry and we won't ever go back to Nickelodeon and that will be that. And later on, the mom makes a big stink about the fact that they never got an apology from Nickelodeon when it all comes out that Jason is a predator, although not because the mom bestirred herself to let the police know, but because some other parent did. And I think to myself, the industry, Nickelodeon owes you an apology. You owe Brandy an apology. You know, it's like this, yeah, Nickelodeon should never employ this joker, right? Of course. But at the same time, 
there were multiple times in which you could have been like, okay, I'm going to check my need to be liked by my daughter and just let her know that this guy's a weirdo and I don't like this and we're not staying. But because she was all up in her feelings about the fact that she needed to prove something to the mother she had who had, you know, nipped, nipped her dreams in the bud. Now she's allowing her daughter to keep going down the primrose path to, you know, the road to perdition is lined with good intentions. Here's the mom like, well, I really want my daughter to have a nice time. I really want my daughter to have everything I didn't have. I really, but you're like, how, how, how could a parent allow this to happen to their child when it's just so obvious that it's not a good thing? You know, it's, it's not, I, it is not even kind of like the next predator that we're going to meet later on in this, who was super slick at being manipulative and making people like him. That guy had it down to a science. This stupid Jason Handy, like, who's over there instant messaging somebody, like, literally, like, two weeks after meeting them, being like, hey, let's go meet at the mall, don't tell your mom. And thinking 11-year-old isn't going to tell their mom about it, you know? Like, you don't know her enough to know, like, you haven't groomed her long enough to make sure she keeps her mouth shut. Okay, so that's the first story in the episode, right? And then we kind of leave off that to talk about what else was going on at Nickelodeon. Dan Schneider is trying to lead children's programming. He wants to kind of grow up out of the industry along with his most favorite person, Amanda Bynes. Amanda is 16 by this point. She's very well known. She's made some movies where she's like trying to become more of a adult. These movies are like romantic comedies for, for like teenage girls. Um, so she's, you know, doing kissing scenes and things like that. She's aging out of this sort of silly SNL idea for kids that she had previously been. And then even her Amanda Bynes show was like a variety show and stuff like that. But now she's trying to do other things as a new project to kind of become more of an adult, um, and to to be able to take on more roles that mirrored the fact that she's growing up. She is now on the WB on a new show called What I Like About You. Dan Schneider was a writer on that show, and he really wanted to usher Amanda into her adulthood. He wanted to be the one to take her by the hand, but also he was using her because he too wanted to get out of the kids' programming. He wanted to go make different kinds of shows. He's over here thinking that Amanda Bynes is going to take him into new realms of fame, and he can go over to WB and write other programs. You remember WB had like all of those programs that were like teenage dramas. But Dan clashed tremendously with the writers on What I Like About You. There was one writer from Friends who worked there, and they, like, constantly were butting heads to the point where Dan was ousted. Like, we're done. You know, you can have your name on the credits as a producer, but you are not going to have any influence on this show. He just had this idea that Amanda belonged to him, and he was going to be the one to continue to create what the world knew as Amanda Bynes. But She worked with other people and for other people now, and Dan no longer had all of this sway over her career that he once had. So he's ousted from the writing room. But what really sliced their relationship in half was the fact that Amanda is growing up and she is wanting more independence. And her parents had always been exceedingly involved in her career. When you see pictures of her and her parents, her parents are a lot older. They like they look like much older parents. I mean, they could have passed for her grandparents, quite honestly. They're very like Amanda's their baby girl. They had been along in the ride for her uh, career. Like her dad had always been kind of like this hovering figure in her career. He was always on set. He was always, you know, making a way for Amanda. He and Dan Schneider were great friends because they both had the same aim to make much of Amanda. Um, you kind of get the idea that Amanda's dad was a bit of a taskmaster, um, and pretty heavy handed. So now that Amanda's getting older and wants more freedom and she's dating a guy that her parents didn't approve of, she decides she's going to run away. I mean, enough already of these old people who, you know, have controlled my life all this time. Look at all the money that I've made for the family. Look at everything that I've done. You know, everybody is coming and feasting at my table, but when do I get mine? It's basically her attitude. She decides to run away. Uh, well, she's hauled right back home. So then she's like, okay, well, <laughs> that's fine. Plan B, I'm going to get emancipated from my parents. And of course, there's a long legacy of child stars becoming emancipated from their parents. A lot of times, you know, the people who are children who have 
been in the industry have parents that really are pretty terrible people. I mean, it's no surprise that half these kids want to be emancipated from their parents who have used them as a cash cow low these many years. So I don't think Amanda Bynes' parents fell in the category of people who were being like abusive or neglectful, but I think she was just over it and wanted to do her own thing. So she tries to get emancipated by bringing Dan into the picture and being like, Dan, help me. And Dan's all about it. He's like, yeah, we're going to figure out a way to get you free of your parents because that's one less influence in her life that he has to contend with. He wants to be all that Amanda ever needed. Well, they take it to court. It does not go well. And Dan's involvement with it is a real blight on his reputation. It's like, what are you doing getting involved with Amanda Bynes trying to be emancipated from her parents who were, by the way, were blindsided by the whole thing. They never saw this coming. And the relationship that they had had with Dan, which had one time been very tight, completely broke down. So it really made the WB, who had been in relationship with Dan, and they never liked him anyway, be like, go back to children's programming, all right? If Nickelodeon wants you, they can have you. We're done over here with you. So Dan does. He's got to crawl back to Nickelodeon. His relationship with his star you know, his favorite star has been severed. Like he's in a bad place. And I think that negativity that he's feeling about himself and his career um, really begins to come out on set at Nickelodeon. Well, he gets right back down to writing his sketch shows. Um, they revive one of his earliest ideas and now they, they're doing it again, a new iteration, a new cast. And a bunch of those cast members come on to talk about their experience with Dan and now that he's, you know, back at Nickelodeon. And in the first episode, there was a lot of talk about the fact that the the set had been chaotic, but it was pretty fun. By the time the Amanda Bynes show came on, things were getting darker. That's when we brought on those two writers. Um, and they were talking about how abusive Dan was. But Dan had been like a fun person on set, kind of like a big kid. But now he's an angry person. And there's hell to pay every time he comes around. And they all say that when he would get on set, like the, the temperature would change. You know, he could really instill fear in you. And they all have stories. All of the, there was like, I think, let's see, one, two, three. There's four different cast members that they talk to. Three of those cast members are black and one was white. And like I said last episode, um, the two black guys felt like they were very unfairly treated because of the color of their skin. Giovanni, the girl, doesn't speak about it like that. In fact, she seems like she had, like, she seems like she's taken the whole thing in stride. She had a big scrapbook that she had back from her Nickelodeon days that, you know, they show a lot of. And, you know, she is able to admit that there was some, like, you know, it was crazy. And Dan was crazy. But she doesn't seem like she's born this as, like, scars on her soul the way the two guys do. They are really, really, really hurt and cut down by what they said they experienced on this show. And I don't want to invalidate their experience because it does seem like from the stories that they tell, there was a lot of, you know, giving the white kids attention, but then kind of giving them the side eye, making them feel like, you know, they could never get close to Dan. Dan always held them at arm's length, according to them. And they didn't necessarily have a lot of specific stories when that happened. So I don't know if it was just a feeling, a vibe. I don't know. But that's what they say happened. Um, and some of the things that these four cast members talk about are the fact that they had to do a lot of things on these sketch comedy shows that were physically arduous, tiring, you know, they're constantly going past child labor laws as far as how long the kids were working on set. Um, but I have to say that some of their complaints kind of didn't ring to me as a sort of thing that should traumatize you in adulthood. Now, I think Dan, you know, ripping on set and calling you an idiot because you did something that he thought was dumb. Yeah, I can imagine that voice getting stuck in your head if a major producer on a show constantly called you stupid or made or looked down on you or made you feel less than and you knew that he didn't like you like I can understand that but then some of the things that they were complaining about having to do on the show I'm like you guys were kids and I can't imagine that as a kid you didn't think that was kind of fun um for example there was this one thing called on air dares and it was kind of like a kid's version of fear factor well here's the thing fear factor in and of itself is kind of a childish idea let's dare each other to do the dumbest stuff ever you know and 
Uh, but what's interesting is there were two people from the cast, um, the white, the, this one white guy and this one black guy who really hated the on-air dares and basically said that it had been this traumatizing event where you didn't ever know what you were going to have to do. And some of this stuff was really scary. And some of the stuff they said was really weird. And some of it was, I mean, one guy said that he had been dipped in a tank of peanut butter, basically, then laid out and a bunch of dogs had to come lick the peanut butter off of him. So that's weird and gross. Like it would just feel like nasty. You know, the whole thing was like gross. Like who would even want to do that? Um, but I'll tell you who would do that. A bunch of kids. Like what kids aren't constantly daring that? Like, I dare you to do this. I dare you to do that. Especially a bunch of boys. You know, I, I, I feel like the audience watching that would have been like, oh man, that's so cool. I wish I could have done that. I bet I would have done better at that dare. Like, so I'm, I, what I'm trying, I was trying to figure out was what is the offensive thing about some of this? Is being dunked in a tub of worms offensive if you didn't come up with the dare yourself and so you, you weren't mentally prepped for that? Is that the thing that they say has traumatized them into adulthood? Because I'm telling you, I just think that kids would any like pick any random kid off the street they would have loved to have a chance to see if they could you know make it in the tub of worms you know if they would be able to you know what it would feel like to be dipped in a tub of peanut butter you know it's just like i just don't know if the if it's like the adult version of these people is looking back and being like that's weird why like why would adult me want to do that kid me must not have liked that either i think is it possible that what they didn't like was a lot of the other things that were happening on set? And now as adults, they look back and they're like, and that was another time when I was used and abused for other people's entertainment. I'm like, yeah, you're an actor. That's what being an actor is. You're used and abused for other people's entertainment. That's why I'm trying to figure out why y'all would want to do it in the first place. Regardless. And then one of the guys had a story where, and I don't know. I mean, is it just racially insensitive of me to not get this? Maybe. I'm sure people will let me know. One guy had this, told a story about how they were doing this sketch and he was supposed to be the, 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 the littlest rapper in history. And so the nickname for the littlest rapper was Lil Fetus. <laughs> so Lil Fetus is supposed to be a baby. So they've got to put like a full body suit on him, like a flesh colored body suit because he's a baby. He doesn't have any clothes on. And wardrobe department comes in as he's doing his makeup and being like, we got to get a different color. We got to get like a charcoal body suit. And this guy, in the retelling of it, it was almost like he was re-traumatized telling it. You know, he's like, I, I started to tear up. The makeup artist had to put her hand on my shoulder. Let me know, like, don't listen to that. That's just garbage, you know? And he's like, as a black man in therapy, these are the kind of things I'm trying to get over. And th these are the kind of racist things that I had to contend with that are still affecting me as an adult, you know? Because of what Nickelodeon did to me, it's hard for me to, you know, kind of be in the world and just deal with how racist people are because like what kind of person would do that what kind of person would say that you know that's the kind of stuff I knew I should get my mom uh on set for you know but I also knew she was going to raise hell if I had told her about it so I like I had to keep it to myself that somebody said I you know you have to get a charcoal bodysuit for me but I'm like wait but your skin is dark I mean I don't know like if if a soup like a super red-headed pale kid was supposed to be playing some kind of individual as a baby and the wardrobe person comes in and is like, we don't have a suit white enough for this kid. Would that be something that kid would have to contend with the rest of their life? I, I wonder. Maybe, I mean, maybe it would hurt your feelings if you felt like people are always making fun of your pale skin or something like that. And you were like, here's another, you know, this, this adult made, made fun of me and called me really pale or whatever. I mean, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like something as an adult I would really be marinating in. And it could just be because we are about to move on to the rest of this episode in which there's really some bad stuff that happens. So the peanut butter that you had licked off of you, the charcoal bodysuit somebody suggested that they needed, really pales in comparison. And I know you're not supposed to like compare traumas because everybody's experience is different, but some people's experience is categorically and factually worse. And let's talk about that. Well, the episode wraps up talking to these cast members uh, about their experience uh, by discussing the one guy who said that his mom 
would have raised hell on set if he had told her about the charcoal bodysuit because she was consistently questioning what she was seeing. She was like the one adult who was like, things are weird around here. This is a house of horrors. Like what is happening around this place? You know, she didn't like the fact that there was one set where her black kid was being set up as like a crack dealer, except his crack was Girl Scout cookies. She thought that was tasteless. She didn't like the fact that one skit had a producer who was getting a massage on set. And the mom was like, that's not appropriate for kids television. And so there was all this, the woman was always raising questions. The kid's agent was like, you need to stop asking questions. Like, let your kid do his thing. Stop getting in the way. You're going to wreck it for him. And eventually, it would seem that maybe she did wreck it for him. Although, I'm like, your mom did you the biggest favor ever. But he wasn't invited back on. And they kind of transitioned the show of the mom being like, my son resented me from that day on. It broke our relationship because he blamed me for him not getting invited back on. But in retrospect, maybe it was a really good thing he wasn't because all hell was about to break loose. And indeed it was. So you'll recall that at the beginning of the episode, we're introduced to Brandy, who had been essentially groomed by Jason, and then he sent her ugly pictures. Um, Brandy never went back to the industry. But one day, Brandy's mom gets a phone call from the police. Remember, Brandy's mom hadn't bothered herself to call the police, lest he think she'd be a bad mother. So she just let that predator roam free and didn't say anything to anybody. But somebody decided to bestir themselves and get the police involved. And the police called her and said, do you know the name Jason Handy? And the mom's like, I'm very familiar with Jason Handy. And they said, can we talk to Brandy? Because we, we've found it, his house has been raided. Another child had been preyed upon by Jason. In that scenario, the parents had let it go even further. Jason had been at their house playing video games with their daughter in her room with the door closed. And Jason had tried to kiss the girl and um, the girl freaked out about it and her, told her parents and the parents told the police and the police raided his house and found ridiculous amounts of child. You know what I'm saying? And so not only that, but little baggies with girls' names on them, with little things inside the baggies, letters, notes, one seven-year-old child had somehow managed to get Jason a pair of her underwear. So yeah, the police wanted to talk to Brandy. So Brandy tells her story and they've got the story of the other little girl who he was in, you know, who he tried to kiss. And so Jason's arrested. Now the PA, let me tell you, is given 16 years in jail for his crimes. And then he's got a registered sex offender when he comes out, right? Okay, good, right? Got that guy. And the mom, like I said earlier, is really offended because she's like, Nickelodeon never apologized. But Nickelodeon had bigger fish to fry because now about four months later, yet one more person goes down. And this guy's name was Brian Peck. Peck had been a member on that crew since the beginning. He was part of the Dan Schneider machine. He was a dialogue coach officially, but he also had this weird little bit part that he did on the shows, this weird returning character of this guy that they called Pickle Boy. Pickle Boy likes to hurt and tease pickles. What does that mean? Like, what is that joke? And he just like, he's like this soundless individual who just walks around making a lot of facial expressions with his giant tray of pickles, offering people pickles, but like never saying anything. It's like, what is this character? What is this joke? And everyone's like, Dan Schneider's got the craziest sense of humor. That joker. <laughs> Who could ever figure him out? Not us. But if he thinks pickles are funny, the kids will probably do too. Dan's got that way. He knows what the kid's like. But even the kids on this show were like, we didn't get the pickle thing. And the mom, who supposedly was causing all that problem, uh, you know, she's like, those, nobody else sees what those look like, you know, but nobody, nobody did, supposedly. So Brian Peck was a guy that was on set all the time. He played with the kids all the time. They played Nintendo with the kids, foosball with the kids. He was just always around and everybody loved him. Everyone trusted him. He knew how to make everybody laugh. The parents thought he was hilarious. They loved him. It was just one thing after another, uh, like he, he had people over to his house for big barbecues. Everybody knew him. Everybody liked him and nobody suspected him. 
And, you know, at first you want to be like, yeah, that's kind of the, the pickle boy thing is weird, but maybe you didn't come up with that. And that's maybe it really was like, Dan does have that weird sense of humor. And if that was all you'd ever seen about him, it's like a dumb joke he didn't write, you know? So the pickle boy thing is weird, but if everything else about him was just like this fun guy on set, why would you suspect him? Well, I tell you when you could have started suspecting him. At one of these barbecues, he has everybody over the house. And one cast member was talking about how it was weird. It was odd at this guy's house. Because his house was, he had a nice house. But he had this one room that was devoted all to comic books and old kids' toys. And on the one hand, you want to say, well, that's kind of weird. But I wouldn't think that would make anybody a predator. They're just a collector, right? And especially of old things. He, like, loved old Hollywood. He loved... You know, it all it all kind of fits in together, this this nostalgia for old America, the old comic books from, you know, the 30s, the old toys and all of this, all this Americana, right? And then his garage was set up like this set of Planet of the Apes. It was like the shrine to the Planet of the Apes. But this one boy, this cast member, he said that he went into the garage and there was a picture that really stood out to him because it didn't match the theme of Planet of the Apes. It was a clown a birthday clown holding some balloons and so he asked peck about it he's like brian what's that and he gets all excited and he's like let me show you let me show you You won't believe this turns the picture around and on the back it is inscribed to him by who do you think john wayne gacy the serial killer now to this boy's credit He's like, that's wild. And he goes and he's like, hey, 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 y'all, look what he's got. And he brings all these people in. Does Peck act like he needs to keep that a secret? Uh Uh-uh. He's telling everybody, yeah, you won't believe it. Look who it is. But it's not like this weird one-off where he had this picture from the serial killer, which how would you ever get your hands on that? But, But it is inscribed to Brian, all right? But then Brian brings them inside into his room opens the bedside table drawer and pulls out a stack of letters and pictures from the serial killer. Letting them read them. Look at this. Isn't this crazy? I got all these letters. Like, he's proud of it. He's not hiding it. John Wayne Casey killed and tortured young boys. Okay? A sicko, if ever there was one. So how, at at, at what point did the parents who were at that party go, ooh, I don't like this. At no point, at no point did any parent go, my kid's never working with Brian again. Anybody who wants to have a pen pal relationship with a serial killer isn't somebody that my kid's going to hang around with. You'd think. Well, uh, no parent bothered to bestir themselves. But four months after Jason Handy is thrown into the slammer, it comes to light that Brian Peck has 16 counts against him for harming a child and that he has been pulled off Nickelodeon and he too will be serving some time. Now we're going to get into the time that he served, but that's for another episode. For now, let it just lay there right here. Nickelodeon sits the cast down for a table reading of their next show because the show must go on, right? We've lost Jason, we've lost Brian, but the show must go on. And they sit all the kids down for the table reading. The parents are in the room. There's a bunch of people there that the kids don't know. But they're like, whatever, maybe they're just people from Nickelodeon. Dan stands up and dismisses the parents and says, hey, we need to talk to the kids for a minute. Can you guys like head out? The parents do it. What? What? Like, I I would be like, what are you about to tell my kid that I can't know about? Why were all these parents so trusting of these people they don't know? You don't know Dan Schneider. Anyway, the parents are like, okay. And they all get up and they walk out. At which point, they tell the kids that Ryan Peck's not coming back. And they lay out for the kids that he has, has been accused of hurting a kid. They don't know. It's a John Doe. Nobody knows who it is. In fact, even the people, the cast members who are being interviewed for this documentary had not heard who it was. They did not know who it was. They didn't even know it was somebody that they knew. They thought it might just be a child out in the world that he'd hurt. Anyway, they are told, the children at the table are told, hey, there are some allegations against him, so we're going to let him go. Do you guys have anything to say? Anything to add? 
Like what kid, if he has been abused repeatedly by an adult, would suddenly at this point at a table reading with all of his friends and then a bunch of people that they don't know be like, oh, I have a story to tell. Who was expecting a hand raise in that scenario? Anyway, everyone sits there like crickets, you know, and then they let the kids go and they're like, okay, all right, thanks. Well, just want to let you guys know Brian's not gonna be hanging around anymore. And that was that. And then nobody ever talked about it again. Like there was a little bit of like, what would happen to Brian? But it was all swept under the rug. Like, let's just get it over with. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. And then the episode ends where the different cast members are like, we never knew who it was. We wondered to this day who it was. Like, when did it happen? How did it happen? Who did it happen to? We didn't have any of the details. And then the episode ends with Drake Bell taking a seat. And you know he's the one that was abused at the hands of Brian Peck. And the next episode is his whole story. And it's solely devoted to his story. Because he had never told it before this documentary. Now, it's no bombshell that I'm telling you. Everybody knows now that's who it was. But his experience is so dark and terrible. And he doesn't spell it out for us. I mean, he can't even... It's. I have never seen anybody so hurt and uncomfortable discussing something that had happened to them, like to the point they can't get their words out about it. And my heart just went out for him so much. Like I just get chills thinking about like how hard that must have been to sit in front of a camera and talk about that. And it shouldn't have happened to him because his dad actually was watching out for him. And that's the sad thing about this whole story is that he actually had parents who were very involved, a dad who really loved him. If there was ever a person who should not have found himself in that scenario, it should have been Drake Bell. But anyway, that's for next week. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me on this episode. What did you think about some of the stuff that we talked about today? And why in the world are so many of these parents just letting things go? Letting things go. Even if you weren't the person, say like Brandy's mom, who had so many red flags literally waving in her face. What about if you, if your kid was truly this uncomfortable on set, the way they describe now as adults having been so uncomfortable on set? What would the harm have been in saying, hey, we don't need to do this. I don't think this is healthy for you. If your self-esteem and your sense of self is being so degraded, you've got this voice in your head all the time now telling you that you're dumb and you're stupid. Like that's not true about you or that you're fat or that you're not as cute as this person or that you're this or you're that, you know, you're not as talented as this person. Like those things aren't true about you. And if I'm not going to put you in an environment where every day you're being forced to compare yourself to other people and you're having grownups talk to you like this, it's not worth it. And if you can't see it, let me see it for you. You know what? What? Like we've got to call ourselves to better. If there are children in our care, we have to make sure that they are being cared for. And if you, if you're still wrestling with the vestiges of some kind of childhood wound, like that one mom who felt like she hadn't been allowed to live her dream, deal with that on your own. Don't deal with it involving your kid where you put your child in harm's way just so you can tell yourself that you're the fun mom. Anyway, that's just my final thought. I will talk to you guys later, another episode on this series coming out this week. So talk to you then. Bye.